Okay, welcome to part two of week five, talking about force surveys. Um, like I've mentioned, I, I, it's a very large and complicated topic. It seems like it should be fairly straightforward and you know, people have been doing these for decades and so it should all be worked out and so forth. But it, it's actually a pretty tricky topic. I mean, when you're trying to balance um, how much time you have in the field, what kinds of data you can capture in that amount of time so you're trying to optimize a lot of things and you're also trying to address specific objectives in that forest survey. You know, what is the purpose of this? Is this an assessment of habitat diversity or species diversity? Or are you actually trying to go out and see something very specific about the landscape? And I you know if some of you go on to become consultants and so forth, you might be asked by different companies to go out and measure specific things about the the forest in relation to a product that they are developing or breeding program that they have, you know, so you really have to take all those things in consideration in each forest survey to me is kind of unique. I mean, it's very hard to have a, a generalized, you know, universal uh, protocol. And I think that's part of what we are dealing with is like, you know, everyone has different objectives. Everyone has different interests and, but how can we bring that all together into some way that we can communicate and share data and so forth? Uh, so it's actually quite a complicated topic and I've, something I've been thinking about. I mean, I first, you know, back in 1990s, 1989, actually, actually back in 1989 when I uh, went to Cameroon and I was told to do a biodiversity survey in Cork National Park and you know, we kind of started from scratch and how to do this, you know, objectively and without bias and so forth. And, you know, it was it was fairly complicated and actually fell apart for various reasons that were mainly political, not really uh, having to do with the surveys. And so, you know, I got a very early taste right out of undergrad, had to start to think about this, you know, in the field, on my feet. And uh, that's kind of, I guess, what I'm trying to recreate with this uh, project that you're doing as well. It, it's... Um, it's a learning process and I really think gaining the experience without a whole lot of preconceptions or a whole lot of you know debate about different terms in your head and just go out and look at the forest just go out there and look around and see what you see I really want you to do that first um, so in a way I mean all of this experience that I have actually makes the topic quite complicated I mean like I, there's a great quote that I read once I can't even remember where I saw it uh, but it was about as I was going to China I read this, you know, it said, you know, you go to China for a week, you can write a book, go to China for a few months, you might write an article, go to China for a year or longer, and you learn to shut up because you <laughs> you don't really understand much of what's going on. And that's what I feel about surveys. I mean, you, you uh, see a lot of difficulties and complications when you have a lot of experience with them. Um, so, you know, just a quick... Uh, rundown of how to do them. I, I feel like, you know, enough of you are asking, you know, I need more information about how to get started and so forth. So I thought I'd kind of run through some things and actually give you an example. Uh, so, you know, four surveys typically start with transects that are randomly distributed across the study site to provide adequate coverage of the habitats and the study site. You know, you can't intensively sample everything, <clears throat> but you want to try to lay in transects that kind of are randomly distributed. Uh, and they generally originate from a road, but you want to kind of go in, you know, somewhat perpendicular to that road, and you don't want them to cross or get too close to one another. So you have certain uh, guidelines. You make certain decision rules, and that's a big part of it. It's like making these decision rules as you go along, writing them down and remaining consistent with those decision rules. And so you decide, okay, you know, they can't be within 200 meters of each other, and so you actually have to go and lay them out. You know, you can draw them first and... and so that's what I did in this project that I'm going to describe. So, but you constrain them, you know, so that there's they're roughly within some perpendicular direction from the road, but uh, they can vary and they don't cross. And, and you take these considerations, and then you go along this transect and you first survey, you know, what's the forest type, conditions, habitats that you can find, and you might collect a little bit of quick data along a belt width. You know, you might five meters on each side or something. You might be counting the the some particular plant that you're interested in or 
uh, a nesting site or you know something like that. You might have something that you're just measuring very quickly along this transect that you can see and and uh, gather the data just really as you walk through. Um, you know those kinds of things that can help you assess the forest condition uh, in relation to your objectives. And so um, the thing that I'm going to be talking about is this study that I did a long time ago where we looked at selected log forest in West Kalimantan and you know so I was counting tree stumps and so I wanted to have an idea about how much intensity uh, what was the logging intensity in that area and so along the belt widths I kind of measured I just simply counted the number of tree stumps that I saw as a rough measurement of the kind of local disturbance and I would again suggest the textbook Aims and Methods of Vegetation Ecology by Miller Dubois and Ellenberg. It's written, you know, 40 years ago almost now, but uh, I think it really remains one of the most uh, straightforward resources for describing how to do these things and how to think about it. And I, you know, I, I reference you to a vegetation ecology textbook because it does kind of start with vegetation. I mean, habitat is oftentimes defined by the vegetation type growing in an area. So I think this is a good place to start. So I, I want to use the study that I did in West Kalimantan as an example. Uh, so, you know, this was a process. We went to this place. We had permission from the government and from the local concessionaire to go in and do some uh, sampling of the forest after it had been selectively logged. This was before we had a lot of remote sensing data, you know, so we didn't have satellite images, we didn't have good, uh, we didn't have Google Earth, certainly, this is long before then, this is, you know, 1990, 1991, uh, and so, you know, it was a bit of a challenge, so how, what could I do? And, you know, there was a main logging road running along uh, that you could travel on, you know, the logging trucks were running up and down. And then there were smaller logging roads running off of that that had been abandoned. And so I was going into some log forest that was eight or ten years old, and there was a minor logging road going in there that had been somewhat overgrown. So you could walk in, but, you know, occasionally there'd be a tree over it or be overgrown and you'd have to hack your way. So selectively logged forest is very difficult to walk through until you're really clearing a path. You really have to have a team of people uh, clearing a path if you really want to travel through it. Uh, if you want to get off the road. Uh, and so, you know, went along this minor road and kind of mapped that first and then began to lay out my transects. And so, as I said, you know, you kind of lay them out perpendicular. So I've got this little schematic here that I'm showing you. you, know, you I have these transects running off in these different directions and they're all a kilometer and a half long. And so I laid these out, you know, and then began to uh, look at... Um, Oh yeah, I just wanted to mention, I forgot, uh, these are the publications that came out of this study and uh, you can go back and read those, it gives some details about the sampling design and so forth. And there's an interview that was done, uh, the Environmental Review is a small newspaper run by John Taylor and uh, he interviewed people at different times and he interviewed me about this paper and uh, I say a few things in there that I still kind of believe and I think it's kind of, you might be interested in re reading those. And um, so those are the publications, but back to this schematic. And so, you know, off the main logging road, you have a minor logging road, and then I would lay these transects out. And again, you know, I didn't want them to cross, didn't want them to become too close to one another, but I also kind of wanted them to go off in random directions. I didn't want to bias myself. It's kind of difficult in this situation because the disturbance along the logging road is very intense oftentimes. And then when you got off, it could change fairly rapidly uh, when you got away from that minor logging road. So once I had these, you know, transects laid out and we kind of surveyed them, I'm kind of next showing you a schematic of the transects kind of lined up next to each other, or five transects as an example, kind of lined up against one another. And they're color-coded so that the red is the severely damaged forest, the orange is moderately damaged, the blue is light damage, and green is no damage. And these are just schematics. I mean, this is just not, this is not the actual data. I'm just showing you, you know, the example of what you would see. And so along these transects, we'd have an estimate of how much of the forest was in each type of disturbance category. And you would use that information to then design the rest of your more intensive study. So it's a process of going from very coarse. And so, you know, we went out and along the major logging road and found these minor logging roads going off and we'd hike in and look around and say, okay, 
this is pretty good. You know, the minor logging roads mainly follow the contour of the of the landscape, you know, along ridge tops and things because that's easier to make a road and trucks can drive down and so forth. And so you, you know, slowly refine the sampling process. And so now we actually have an estimate of how much of the forest is in each one of our disturbance categories. And so then using that information, I put down plots. And so on these transects now you can see there are little rectangles. And so we would distribute, and this is what I mean by uh, stratified random sample. And so you want to stratify it so that you actually are capturing a representative amount of each disturbance category, which is what we were interested in in this study. You capture each category in its representative fraction in the landscape. And so, you know, the severely and light damaged forests are about a quarter. There's a little bit more of the moderately damaged forests in this example. And there's a little bit of green as well. And so you want those plots to kind of represent that accurately. Um, and also, you know, you have to deal with things like, you know, do you want these plots to kind of be as much in one forest type as you can so that you get a moderately damaged, you know, if you're interested in, you know, categorizing moderately damaged forest, do you want that plot right in the center of some moderately damaged forest? Or is it okay if it's got a little bit, you know, if it's got a transition into heavily damaged? And a lot of times you can't really control, you know, you can't have an ideal situation where every plot is only in its kind of habitat or its forest type. You actually have to have transitions. And, you know, you shouldn't ignore those transition zones as well. I mean, you're these are kind of rough categories, and so that no man's land between these forest types might be quite interesting as well. And so you want to have a certain number of them along the boundaries as well. And so you know, in this example, I can show you the plots, you know, the they're representative of the amount of the disturbance categories that we found in the forest, and we've got a certain amount of edges between types, as well as uh, plots that are within a single forest type. So this is what I mean by the stratified random sampling. You know, so you, you base it upon empirical data, kind of concerning the distribution and relative proportion of the habitat types or forest types or whatever you're trying to measure. And that ensures that your random sample is actually a representative sample of the landscape. And this is important. I mean, I know, don't know if you've ever seen examples, you know, where you actually scatter random points around. It's very easy to actually, in a random process, to get a pretty biased sample. And where randomness works is actually you have to do it many, 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 many times. But you're not going to be able to go out and do many, many, many surveys. So you're actually just constrained to this one time. And so you want to be unbiased, but you also want to be representative. And so you lay out your uh, plots. And so you might, you know, throw a few out there randomly, and then according to the proportions of forest types in those plots, you begin to constrain where the, the subsequent random plots can fit. So that's what I mean by stratified random sampling. Uh, again, I'd like to say that numerous small replicates are oftentimes better than one large sample, uh, but then you don't want too many tiny little replicates. You know, you want something that's kind of representative of the local community. Uh, you know, that's oftentimes relatively subjective, but you need adequate sized replicates, but it's better to have more of them so that you have some statistical power and you're not affected by kind of variation in one location. So, you know, these could be kind of considered an adaptive survey technique that you're slowly refining the rigor and the detail of your survey uh, as you collect more data and you get more information and you know about the forest more, so you can incorporate that into your sampling design. I mean, I, that's perfectly fine. I think it's actually better to do that than to go into it and acting like you're completely blind because you do want to get a representative sample. I think that's very important. I uh, wanted to mention very briefly, you know, the rapid assessment techniques, and there are several papers there that I put on the website about these rapid assessment techniques, and they've been a major focus for over 20 years. I remember back in Gunn and Palum, uh, Peter Ashton, kind of the father of Southeast Asian uh, floristics, uh, and Mark Layton, they were at Gunn and Palum, and they had this project to kind of perform some rapid assessment surveys, and, you know, very early stages of this kind of idea and going out and having plots you'd set up on the ground, you'd gather up all the leaves that were fallen on the floor, and you'd break them down into the morpho species. Uh, and unfortunately, that I don't really know what happened to that data. It, it was a very interesting attempt, a very early attempt, and uh, those kinds of rapid assessment techniques can be quite effective. 
And now we're getting into metagenomics, you know, we can actually start to take environmental DNA and really get a handle on how many types of uh, markers that we have out there, these loci that we choose as the markers. Again, there are limitations to this approach uh, and debate about, you know, what it really tells you and, and how far you can take that data in interpreting the, the composition and diversity of the landscape. But really, the, the objective of a rapid survey is to provide a, a snapshot of the forest, you know, minimizing the time that you spend, minimizing the time and the expense. Uh, what we're doing, I, you know, I don't really see it as a rapid survey, even though in some ways we are trying to maximize our effectiveness and the information that we capture. It's not really rapid in the sense that it's one single snapshot. It's more like a movie that we're trying to, you know, take frames and and think about what kinds of things you can ca capture in that kind of long-term sequential process. And so I want, you know, it's, it's a mixture of rapid assessment and also this kind of long-term perspective. And, and I think it's good to keep that in the back of your mind as we go along. So to quickly kind of discuss, you know, the kinds of things that you try to measure in, in forest surveys, uh, you know, oftentimes biodiversity is a, th is a very important thing. Invasive species, you know, this may be very critical in certain places like Hawaii. Uh, you may be very concerned about a certain species that's invading, and so you monitor that. That may be the focus of your monitoring. Uh, forest condition, soil condition, how do you capture these things? Uh, forest function, uh, are you trying to capture all of these things at once? Uh, you know, this is... Uh, these are questions that we have to kind of start to talk about as we go out there, you know. And again, I'm not going to really provide answers. I want you to think about it in perspective of your organism and so forth. Uh, you know, so if you're thinking about biodiversity, uh, what kinds of things can you measure? Uh, you know, oftentimes people use morpho species. Uh, that's debatable, and there's a publication or two there about using morpho species, its strengths and its limitations. Uh, I encourage you to read that. Um, the indicator groups, you know, there's been a lot of study of if, if you could go out and measure just one group, the birds, for example, or the predators or something, maybe that could be a surrogate or a proxy for measuring the entire forest. And so you can really improve the efficiency of these surveys if you just could go out and look at one type of animal or plant and use these as indicator groups. The results are, you know, uh, debatable. It, there's no obvious answer to the which group is really good as an indicator group. Um, and again, it's kind of depends on the question, depends on what you're trying to monitor. Uh, people have talked about environmental surrogates, you know, using uh, measures of uh, drainage, uh, soil type, to then predict uh, the biodiversity. Uh, that's been debatable, and that's also more related to remote surveys. Um, again, invasive species you might be looking at. And something I'd like to stress is like phenotypic traits. I think phenotypic traits are in a very valuable additional data layer that we can start to add to these surveys and you know instead of being so focused in, on morpho species or species and trying to get a count in the composition of those species maybe we should also really be trying to capture what are the dominant traits out there you know when you're looking at plants you know what are the main leaf types uh, you know how much pubescence do they have these particular kinds of uh, growth forms you know how long how much spaces between the nodes on the plants and so forth. You know, all these kind of traits, I think, could be very useful in actually correlating it more directly with forest condition than you might species. I think it's actually quite difficult sometimes to correlate biodiversity with important aspects of forest condition. But if you can actually think about traits, it, there's a lot of research out there right now about these traits and how those traits do relate to forest type and forest function. So if we can actually go out and survey traits as well as species. And so it's not replacing species, but it's actually it's another data layer. I think that's that's an important thing to think about. Um, so in uh, thinking about these forest surveys, you know, again, kind of think about it as a nested protocol. You're moving from coarse information to more and more fine data. And so that you finally end up with a very detailed survey. Uh, so it, I look at it as an adaptive process that incorporates an increasing amount of information as you gather it. And you know, you, you want to create a representative as well as an unbiased sample. And so using this kind of adaptive approach, this kind of course to find approach, I think is a very good one. 
So ultimately, you know, we really have to define what is truly useful to monitor, what's going to be important in the long run, you know, not just a rapid snapshot, but, you know, in this kind of movie of forest condition over decades, what kinds of things should we be monitoring? Uh, that's an open question, and I would, you know, as we get closer and closer to next summer, we'll be developing those ideas. Um, disturbance and conversion seem like a good place to start, but again, you know, those are kind of coarse things, and so we begin to think about, you know, what are more refined measurements that you might take. Uh, there's a lot of discussion about climate change out there these days and the effects of climate change on forests and so forth. Uh, but in my mind, I think direct anthropogenetic uh, management effects are actually really uh, the dominant force right now and something that it's much more immediate uh, and it's something that we have a little bit more direct control over perhaps, you know, through policy, through taxes and so forth, uh, enforcement of laws those kinds of things uh, have more direct effect on those kind of human activities than you we might really have control on climate change. Uh, but really, with these forest surveys, it's key to get started. You need, you need a baseline. So if you're going to try to monitor change, you have to have some kind of starting point. So when we go to China uh, next summer, we're hopefully going to be putting down some of those baseline data sets so that the future uh, of the reforestation, some of these environmental rubber uh, projects, so that those can be incorporated into kind of a long-term monitoring of those forests. Uh, and uh, just kind of, again, just as a thought, uh, you know, thinking about how to use these forest surveys in the context of citizen science. You know, scientists would have one objective, but what could citizens also do uh, what could they collect to contribute to these processes? You know, is it really even feasible? It, it, it seems like a great idea, but and there may be some excitement about it right now, but, you know, as things, um, kind of as this technology, the newness of this technology wears off and we kind of settle back into, you know, this is everyday experience, can we really keep citizens involved in this? You know, it might be easier as the technology becomes more and more invisible, People may, may be much easier for people to think about going for a hike with a backpack that, you know, has a little video camera on it and it records the forest as they walk along and then they can upload that. And, you know, scientists, uh, forest managers, government officials, whatever, can use this information that someone who just went on a hike uh, gathered with their, you know, just an off-the-shelf uh, camera and a little bit of, you know, using protocols that are developed. Uh, by scientists, so that it can be good quality data. Uh, you know, in general, uh, uh, in, historically, there's uh, a few number of scientists have kind of contributed disproportionately to the advance of science. So, you know, like uh, Albert Einstein, you know, big names like that uh, have contributed central ideas that other people have put lots of pieces together. And so, you know, this citizen science is kind of a, a way of maybe it's more of a, a of an enabling effect. We can enable these people to contribute to this uh, effort and uh, kind of develop ways in which they can all uh, feel like they are part of this uh, process. And kind of, I think that's a big part of it is like enabling them to feel like they can contribute and to feel like they, uh, what they do uh, could have an impact. Uh, and so that's that. That's a key aspect of citizen science, I think, as well. And so it needs to look. It needs it needs to be contributing to something that is ongoing, and that is important. Uh, you know, those are just some thoughts about citizen science, and I'm still thinking about this and how to how to work it out. And I'd love to hear, but you know, if you have thoughts about this as well. Um, anyway, that's going to be the video for today. Thank you.